好唔该见啦，早晨早晨 ，Good morning。This is a meeting of the、uh, Bills Committee on Private Columbaria Bill. This is a 9th meeting. A quorum has been formed, and、uh, we have exceeded the starting time a, a little while. Last time、uh, we were on the cross by cross examination, we reached Schedule 5, Part 1. Actually, we were on part two,、uh, section eight. So we'll start from that particular section, and、uh, our legal adviser will continue to give us advice as we move along. Please turn to the blue bill, C. Three six three zero for the Chinese version, section eight. PS has already briefed us on the content of section eight. I、uh, put ask question ask members whether they had any further question. Some members said sa so. So let's con continue. So, for any further question that members would like to raise、uh, in respect of Section Eight, commencement of ash disposal notice. Legal advisor、uh, for A one A to D. Which one of them is the commencement of ash notice, ash disposal notice? All of them, or just one of them?、Uh, it's all of them for A, B, C, D. It's a N. It's linked by the word N. A to commence the, the disposal of the ashes.、Uh, a notice is required, so it starts with A. So, are you saying that、uh, they should、uh, do all A to D at the same time? Because you need to count、uh, the time when you consider other parts of the bill. Well, they have to、uh, post a notice or or serve a notice on the board. We have to make,、uh, make the calculations. Uh, by with reference to the number of、uh, sets of、uh, ash ashes. So、uh, when when it be begins,、uh, we have the、uh, highest number of.、Uh, so we need to do this. So you have to mention that, that、uh, all these will have to be carried out at the same time. Mr. Wong Kok Heng, I want to ask a a question about one. A.、Uh, Publish a notice in three newspapers in general circulation in Hong Kong, and then in brackets,、uh, one must be in English and one must be in Chinese. 想政府解釋一下點解唔係 ？But you only mention one in Chinese and one in、uh, English. 就係議員，我哋咧係要求佢三份嘅，咁但係咧我哋亦都唔想出現。Well, we want、uh, them to publish the notice in three newspapers. We don't want all of them, all three of them, will be、uh, in Chinese or in English. So we make we make sure that at least one will be in English or in the, in Chinese. We want to make sure that there is at least one in other language. Thank you. 啊，主席，其實咧，我諗緊咧，佢當然呢個一般嘅。Chairman， 呢個 ，you may be talking about the things with a long history。You publish a notice in a newspaper，you may be able to the 
communicate the message. But we may, may be talking about uh, things that, that were done a long, long time ago. I hope you uh, reconsider. For example, new technology, like this. Because now many people really see the new media that the quality is bigger. Please consider new media. They may have a bigger circulation than newspapers. That's just a general suggestion. But uh, I doubt whether we should amend this particular paragraph. Maybe you should uh, allow uh, something to be published through the Internet. I know they all, the newspapers have uh, web uh, editions. But I haven't seen any notice published uh, in their website uh, editions, which has to do with uh, reading habit of people. PAS, yes, we'll consider this. We also require, in addition to newspaper notices, a post a notice and serve a notice on the licensing board. And the addressee should be the authorized representatives, the affected parties, uh, those who enter into the contract for the sale. So they should uh, say it should be informed. Uh, I'll consider Mr. Toe's suggestions content concerning the use of internet media. So please consider that uh, people are are getting used to uh, internet media, online media. So please consider how best uh, the purpose of uh, communication can be served. Mr. Leung Kuo Hong, he said that uh, one must be in English and one must be in Chinese. So I, so you, there will be at least one in English or Chinese, and then the third one, the right to go to heaven or to hell, to, is not uh, unique to Chinese. Uh, we have uh, South Asians, ethnic minorities. So the other one, the third one, can uh, can be not in English, and not in Chinese. Because at least one it must be in English and one must be in Chinese. Uh, you know there's a uh, ethnic uh, polarity in Hong Kong, and South Asians are a big ethnic group. So why don't you mention the South Asians? So in respect of South Asians, uh, they can uh, put up a uh, publish a notice in a uh, newspaper for South Asians. If you say you, uh, they have to do it online. It's uh, not easy to comply because where can you find the uh, notice? If you mention that they they must do it through online media, would would that mean that there's an obligation to comply? Well, first of all, we mentioned one English, one Chinese newspaper. They have also an option to choose in another language, uh, so there is a room for them to choose regarding internet. Well, we've heard the opinion, and we can go back and think about it. Well, if you find, well, a lot of newspapers rely on these. Uh, in the past, uh, uh, as a kid, I would read Waki uh, Yapo, and uh, you could read a lot of notices. If you require them to publish on the internet, it would create some difficulty. 
because uh, internet media, how do you approach them? That's uh, another issue. So my opinion is slightly different from James Toe. If it becomes a legal obligation and you need it to be easy for the person to comply with the law, now if you publish on the internet, well, if they can do so themselves, that's no problem. But according to your legislative intent, uh, you have one English newspaper, one Chinese newspaper. Uh, these are some public uh, services. They are licensed by the Government Information Service. Uh, if, uh, if I publish a newspaper under my own name, uh, it's not considered a newspaper. It has to be licensed. Can I run a paper called Langohong newspaper? Well, it's uh, meaningless uh, according to the law, right? Is that right? Well, the pr newspaper has to be widely circulated. Well, a newspaper is a very special uh, conveyance. Uh, uh, the world has changed a lot. I had been uh, arrested before. We need publishers, and uh, there's a lot of regulation. A proprietor, you need a license. So, Mr. James Toe, uh, he is correct. Uh, when a person has to comply with the law, and if it's very hard to find the media, then it's uh, very inconvenient. If you're talking about internet, you have to publish in the media. Well, how do I find uh, the internet media? It's not regulated. Uh, uh, it's uh, obligation. Let me respond. If you refer to C3640, we have similar media in four bracket one, uh, internet and electronic media. Uh, if we have a suitable media, uh, we can issue a notice and notify them. Well, we are referring to the LLB. The LLB, they have a channel where they can issue a notice. So we can refer to that where they can uh, serve as an internet media or electronic media. Well, Chairman. Now, if the government were to comply with the spirit of the law, you need to specify what that is in the first place, and it has to be feasible. Well, if I uh, create a website, Long Gohong website, and Long Gohong newspaper, well, the LLB they have a website. So, on the internet and electronic media, we need to find the notice. Well, Chairman, uh, it's very easy to create a website. I can get my assent, well, and I can publish. Uh, but, but is that considered uh, 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 an electronic? Me well, a newspaper is. Uh, uh, in the past, you need a license. You need a publisher. Uh, they are accountable, even if there's no censoring. If you uh, publish obscene material, uh, they can get arrested. So, I'm saying. Even from the government perspective, if you cannot, uh, if you cannot define it, uh, it's very cumbersome. I understand that uh, uh, you have to put the notice on the government uh, website. Well, it has to be feasible. That's what I'm saying. Legal advisor, you have anything to add, Mr. James? So, let me clarify. Uh, newspapers, they have a registration regime, but we also have electronic versions of newspapers. The physical newspaper, let's say the person is in Vancouver. They might not have uh, all the newspapers available to them, like Sing Do, Ming Bo. Uh, but in Hong Kong, they might have a lot of uh, electronic newspapers. So I'm thinking 
they just need to uh, publish on the internet site of a registered newspaper. I understand there is a difficulty, and that's what I was uh, thinking of. Let me follow up on my second question. Uh, we have a lot of applications, a lot of operators, of uh, any, so the services operators, they provide an email. Now we are aware that uh, an address you might move, but uh, 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 you, if you lose your email address, uh, you will lose your friends now. So, the addressee, the holder in the records, they have an email address. So. When you serve the notice, it's a physical letter. But if they had provided an email address, then you should also uh, provide a notice uh, to his email address. Then, well, f uh, it doesn't add a lot of work, and they would have all kinds of records. Uh, if you mail it, uh, you have to get the records of uh, mail at the post office. Uh, but email is very cheap, and uh, uh, you should uh, serve notice by email if they have provided an uh, email address. So we're moving ahead with the times. So the addressee, if they have provided an email address, you should serve uh, by email. This is uh, even more practical than A. Thank you. Two and three have clauses where they have to uh, find the addressee. Uh, the specified addressee has to be, uh, uh, they have different means uh, to contact the specified addressee. Well, Chairman, they can go back and think about it because uh, this piece of law will be enforced for a very long time and uh, email will be very important in the coming decades uh, so even if you were to purchase a private column barium you do have to provide email address well I think you, this can be uh, conduct this can be done well BCD uh, they serve a like notice. Why do they say like notices? Well, A is a notice, and you have to provide the information. You have to provide it to the uh, uh, licensing regime. We have different uh, ways to serve notice. Uh, it can be by mail, by uh, newspaper, but the information has to be included. So that's why it's like notice. But if you say the notice, it, it just refers to one type of uh, a media. Okay. So notice and like notice. You are just referring to bracket four. Well, the notice, if it's defined as bracket four, then if you say like notice, then it might not be four. It might give rise to that situation. So we can take a notice and, uh, and uh, label it as meaning bracket four. So we're referring to minimum content as bracket four, but uh, drafting it in this manner, so, as the legal advisor said, would it mean not including four because uh, four is the notice? Four, four is a notice required, like notice. Ninety percent of four is like. 
Well, the content is similar. I understand, Chairman. I understand, Chairman. So A, B, C, D has to include four. I just want something as specific as that. I don't want uh, an interpretation, a misinterpretation of like gnosis, where 90% of bracket four uh, would uh, suffice. Okay. Let's move on to nine. Handling claim for claims for ashes. We're now in section nine. On page C three six three six, we have ashes, and when we move into section nine, it would be clear. We mentioned that in general, if you look at the common law, the caches, uh, ashes uh, don't have an owner, but there are exceptions. Uh, when we liaise with DOJ, they looked at some cases, and they looked at uh, the UK, and there were three cases in 1990 and 2010. In general, uh, there is no ownership, but there are some cases uh, in 1908, in Australia, New South Wales, there were some cases where uh, there was a property ownership, and as times change, we won't rule out uh, possibilities. And uh, aside from ashes, uh, the column barrier, there might be some uh, other uh, material. So when they make a claim, uh, ashes and other material uh, could be sought. So we need to understand in Section 9 what they are trying to make a claim on. And we need to categorize. Uh, in 1, we refer to some definitions. In 3, all the way to 6, it refers to ashes, how the ashes are handled. And from seven to eight, we say that if somebody says uh, that they're the own property owner, so they might not uh, handle it uh, uh, with three to six, they would use seven to eight and nine. Uh, uh, we are now, that's how we would describe section nine. So uh, we're talking about the handling claims for ashes and uh, handing it back to the claimant. So in bracket one, in this section, when we refer to ash handler, so aside from the operator, the uh, mortgage owner, the government uh, department, uh, the FEHD, and so on, uh, these people might be involved. So they are referred to as ash handler. And the definition is that in relation to ashes in respect of which the prescribed ash disposal procedures or the on-site portion of the procedures are being carried out means the person carrying out the procedures. So that is the definition. Next, in bracket 2, the ashes of a deceased person, person may only be returned on the expiry of the first two months of the overall claim period. So I'd like uh, to elaborate. In Section 9, we have two phases. The first phase is the first two months, and the second phase is two months after the overall claim period. Because when we handle this, we don't know if there are contestants uh, to the property. So if we cannot give it to the first claimant, so in the first two months, in this period, we will not uh, return the ashes. We have to wait for the first two months uh, to see how many people are making a claim. If there's only one claimant, then we might be handed to that person. But if there is more than one claimant, let's say two or three contesting the ashes, 
then uh, we have a section who uh, would have the priority. Uh, then if we could uh, identify, then we would hand it to the person with first priority. If we cannot uh, identify it, then we would have to submit it to the courts, and the courts would rule, and we would uh, follow the court ruling. That is the concept. We don't want uh, the first claimant and then have other claims. Uh, it would be it would be chaotic if the ashes have already been uh, given to the first claimant. So, after the expiry of the first two months, uh, the ashes will be returned. So, not in the first two months. In other words, record three, on expiry of the first two months, the ash handler must return. The ashes of a deceased person, A, in the case of uh, receiving only one claim from a prescribed claimant uh, to that particular prescribed uh, claimant, or B, if the ash handler receives uh, two or more claims, completing claims from uh, prescribed claimants, then under Roman 1, the ashes will be returned to the prescribed claimant whose claim has the highest priority under subsection 5. Or, if the competing claims are of equal priority, then uh, the ashes will be returned in accordance with subsection 6, and that is the matter will have to be settled in court. So the, that's in relation to the f uh, first two months uh, and uh, whether one claim or more than one claim has been received. And then after the expiry of the first two months, so we proceed to a next, the next stage. We you know the overall uh, claim period can last as long as 12 months. So after the expiry of the first two months, from the third uh, to the twelfth month, uh, this is the procedure to follow. If the ash handler does not receive any claim for the return of the ashes from any prescribed claimant, the ash handler must return the ashes to a prescribed claimant who make, first makes a claim in the remainder of the overall claim period. So in from the third month to the twelfth month, the first claimant comes forward, uh, the ashes will be returned to him or her. So a claimant should come forward uh, in the first two months, and uh, we don't want to be uh, waiting forever and ever. From the third to the twelfth months, the first claimant will, will, will get the ashes. And then B, if uh, before the ashes are returned in accordance with paragraph A, let's say in the third month someone comes forward or more than one person uh, claims the ashes, uh, more than uh, if there are two, for example, uh, prescribed claimants, then we have to look at uh, C3638, Roman 1, the ash handler must return to ashes. Uh, to the prescribed claimant whose claim has the highest priority under subsection 5, or Roman 2, if the competing claims are of equal priority, the ash handler must return the ashes in accordance with subsection 6, and that is uh, is uh, settled in court. We will now proceed to subsection 5 and subsection 6. Five and six are about the well, the way the ashes are returned in determining the priority of competing claims among prescribed claimants. 
And the following rules apply. A. If there are two or more than two authorized uh, representatives in competition, please refer to C. 3396 for the definition of uh, authorized representative. There's a second one on, in, on page C3396, authorized representative. And here's the definition. The authorized uh, representative in relation to an agreement for the sale of an internment right means a person who is authorized under the agreement to claim for the return of ashes interred under the agreement. And that is uh, that, that person is uh, an authorized representative for the re claiming the ashes. So authorized, a uh, authorized representative enjoys a higher uh, priority over others. But there may be more than one uh, authorized uh, representative. If there, uh, there are competing claims from two or more authorized representatives. Then under Roman 1, the order of priority follows that stated in the agreement for the sale of the internment rights concern. So in the agreement, uh, it will be lay down that uh, A has uh, person A has uh, has the first priority and person B second priority and so on and so forth or if uh, there's no order of priority listed then the claims the competing claims from uh, authorized representatives have equal priority and that means the case will have to be to go to the to a court and B, an authorized representative's claim has priority over that of a personal rep representative or relative because uh, the wish is expressed at the time when the agreement for sale was signed. So the authorized representative's claim uh, has priority over that of a personal representative or relative. And then C, if there is if there are competing claims from uh, a relative and a personal representative then uh, they have equal opportunity equal uh, priority so this is about the uh, the 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 way uh, priority is decided So if uh, there's one has a higher priority, the ashes will be returned to the one with higher priority. But if they enjoy equal priority, that the case will have to be handled under six uh, in a court. If the ash handler receives claims uh, referred as referred to in subsection three B two or four B two, and that is uh, competing claims, the ash handler must keep the ashes until a prescribed claimant obtains a call order for their return to the prescribed claimant and must return the ashes as ordered. Or if uh, in the overall claim period uh, uh, by the expiry of 12 months after the overall claim period, if there's no call order, the ashes must uh, be uh, delivered to the director. We don't want things to drag on forever. The overall claim period is 12 months. If there are competing claims uh, which have to be decided by the court, the court may need time to handle the case. So if it's done um, within 12 months and then uh, Ashes will be returned in accordance with the court order. If it's over 12 months, after the expiry of 12 months, then if there's no court order, the ashes will be delivered to the director. And then later, we will talk about how the director would uh, do. He would uh, wait until a court order is uh, granted. But uh, for unclaimed ashes, 
and then bracket seven. Please uh, just pause here. The other parts are on uh, the items, and uh, what about ashes? Any questions on the on ashes, Mr. Wu Chiwai? That we have been given a long briefing on this. Well, actually, uh, the niche is purchased by a certain person. Is that particular person authorized to deal with the uh, ashes and the items? I just can't imagine why suddenly ashes are claimed. It may have to do with a contested uh, inheritance or, or the estate. So please clarify whether the uh, claimant has the equal status as the uh, personal representative. Well, the purchaser may 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 be the deceased. Well, uh, the ashes are not just claimed for the purpose of uh, conflicts in uh, inheritance. Because uh, well, the uh, offspring uh, may wish to claim ashes uh, in accordance with Chinese custom. When we talk about 58, 59, 60, 61, and 64, some uh, operators are permit holders and so on and so forth. And we may also have to uh, Consider the case of uh, the landlord or mortgage, mortgage, mortgage and uh, reentry of the uh, government land, or winding up a process, official receivers office and uh, FHD. Uh, they can all be uh, playing the part of uh, the ash handler. Very often, uh, this is just the operator. I think we are here dealing with scenarios uh, whereby the uh, operator of the columbarium has to uh, close close down the columbarium, so that there's there must be a procedure to handle the uh, whatever in the in the niches. I think we are talking about uh, such a scenario, right? Uh, yes. If uh, the uh, columbarium uh, is abandoned, uh, these provisions can also apply. So we cannot just look at government columbarium. Uh, they will be here uh, in perpetuity. Oh, uh, if there's no further question, Mr. Chen Hanpan, I want to clarify something. The uh, authorized representative has priority in the hand in the uh, handling of the ashes. If the columbarium operator is an uh, authorized representative, and if one day he doesn't want to operate the columbarium anymore. Would he still be, has the the right to handle the ashes? Well, we've been advising the, the consumer to be careful about one's own inches. If you authorize someone to handle the ashes, you have to think carefully about your choice. For example, you can ask uh, one of your. Uh, Offspring or relatives. 
So uh, are you going to really just op authorize the uh, columbarium operator? We saw could. Just now the, the secretary said that uh, we will not uh, authorize the operators of the columbarium. I'm saying that the consumers, when they make that uh, decision, they need to consider carefully who uh, should they authorize to deal with the ashes. Well, if somebody is selling column barrier, they need to sign an agreement that you have to authorize uh, the authorized person of the column barrier, private column barrier. Well, the senior citizen, when they before they purchase, uh, they might have signed uh, some papers. So after some time, the authorized the the operator of the column barrier is the authorized person. They would have priority in handling the ashes. If they run out of business, then it's up to the operator to handle the ashes, not the, the next of kin. Well, we will go back and examine that and respond later. Uh, Chairman, do you understand? Uh, so uh, you're saying there's a conflict of role. The operator of the column barrier has been authorized. The operator, when they operate column barrier, when they sell the space, they might require the buyer to sign some documents, and there might be some clauses saying that uh, they are authorized to handle the ashes. If they are licensed, uh, then it's no problem. But if it's not, if it's on shaky ground, they might their license might be revoked. They might require uh, the purchaser to uh, sign some agreements to handle the ashes. And if they seize operations, can they handle the ashes? Well, they might have someone disperse the ashes. They might not notify the next of kin, and they might have disposed of the ashes. I just want to understand a little bit in depth. I understand the legislator's concern. There is a conflict of role. We will uh, consider this point. Chan Wai Yip. Chairman, I want to understand the arrangement. I mentioned the different column barrier, the purchase contract. There are an infinite variety of contracts. Sometimes it's just a management contract. It's not uh, control of the column barrier uh, space. It's just a management contract. And they say that uh, that space is uh, 50,000 and they uh, help you manage that uh, column barrier space. So, uh, are there any problems? Uh, and I've asked her, uh, once you enter a legal, uh, dis uh, legal uh, discussion, so in the, uh, the clauses in the contracts, uh, are there any gray areas? such that uh, your regulation of certain column barrier will lose effect. Thank you. For, we are dealing with two issues. One is uh, the handling claims for ashes, and we try to ensure they, they can uh, retrieve the ashes. Uh, previously, we had stated very clearly, that retrieving the ashes should not affect the consumer regarding the uh, uh, regarding the conditions that have not been met. Uh, for example, they uh, agreed to store it to 2047, and uh, the consumers can seek compensation on services uh, not yet fulfilled. So. That will not have an impact. They can seek compensation. Oh, I want to ask. Just now, we I refer to different contracts. Do we have contracts that cannot be uh, that cannot uh, be be enforced? 
uh, for example, we have uh, property management uh, 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 laws. Uh, they can set up a owners incorporated uh, uh, under certain conditions. So, do we have <coughs> any clauses that can deal with the gray areas of the law that overrides uh, these uh, contracts, uh, such that uh, the consumer uh, is protected, even though there might be some gray areas? Well, Chairman, you are, he is referring to uh, something that we had a detailed discussion before. Uh, for example, in Schedule 4, uh, we now, uh, well, what you're talking about authorizing. Well, if uh, some clauses do not uh, allow authorizing, and if you cannot override the management company, so I'm not sure how absolute uh, the, the law is. Will consumers, uh, uh, will, are they, will their interests uh, be compromised? Well, this is uh, similar to what Mr. Tanang Ban mentioned. That is, when uh, let's say if we have uh, set aside uh, 90 million contracts, even if you have 9,000 different contracts, uh, that is still. Uh, hard to deal with. How do we safeguard consumer interests? If you say that uh, the contracts cannot be overridden, and uh, if uh, Tanang Ban's question arises, then how uh, sh can we follow up? Yes, uh, we will uh, go back and examine this. Well, if we have the law, they should comply with the law. Uh, contracts are just contracts. Uh, if you have some arrangements under the contract, it cannot override the law. So we will uh, examine this in greater detail. Okay, thank you. Mr. Leung, go home. Well, it's actually very simple. After legislation, you you purchase the column barrier space, and uh, and now uh, we have uh, existing uh, contracts, uh, uh, numerous contracts, uh, almost a hundred million. Uh, you have not purchased the column barrier space. You have just and trusted them or commissioned them to manage this column barrier space. So the consumer might not be protected. Uh, and we're say, asking if if we have really lousy contracts, it's the same as a labor ordinance. Uh, the, the employee can sign all kinds uh, of contracts with the employer. So even if they willingly say, sign a contract that is worse than a labor uh, or uh, ordinance requirements, then the, uh, the labor ordinance would override that. So legislators are just trying to clarify this. Otherwise, you have to understand why uh, lawyers charge so much is because they are looking for loopholes. And they say, yes, uh, that's the law. Uh, my client doesn't f fall under the, uh, the law. Uh, he's not selling a column barrier space. He's just managing column barrier space. So this is our concern. So you should have a clause that says that if we have contracts that uh, f do not comply with the law, then they should be void. Well, I didn't read the documents. I'm just saying, uh, I'm just thinking that there uh, should be the spirit of the law. So, if you can review this, then it would uh, solve our problem. We're just trying to protect the public. Uh, the general public are not, uh, do not, are, uh, un they do not understand this. We want their rights to be protected under the written law. So we, they don't need to uh, hire lawyers to fight the case. 
Uh, yes, we understand. We're not uh, trying to. Uh, we're not trying to give you problems. Uh, uh, just now, Mr. Albert Chan has already uh, stated the problem. Uh, I respect uh, the secretary. Uh, sometimes I run into her at midnight uh, after work. Uh, I've seen her coming out of the office at uh, midnight. Thank you. So financial uh, interest and handling of ashes uh, on the last occasion. We had a detailed discussion. The clause 56 is applicable area. So the uh, the private column barrier, if they might change uh, ownership, uh, this will still cover that. And you see, we have foreseen in C 3632. In C, they might have uh, received a license, and there are other conditions. Uh, you don't know what kind of contracts you signed. They need to go through reasonable procedures, and the, uh, this clause, we we have uh, 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 covered uh, the consumer interest. Uh, so if they uh, purchase the column barrier space and uh, the financial interest, that is uh, in a separate that is dealt in a separate section. Okay, we can continue, Mr. Wu Jiwei. Regarding the authorized person handling the ashes, well. It sounds like there are two crucial times. So before the law is enacted and after the law is enacted, the specified authorized person, so the license, uh, private column barrier operators, and when they sign contracts with the consumers, do we have a, a, a mandatory provision? And second, and before enactment, well, we have a lot of transactions. There are some. There are many different contracts. A lot of them do not have a specified column barrier. Manage uh, manager and uh, uh, authorized person. So the person assisting is that equivalent to the authorized person of the private column barrier. So in this, can I understand it? Uh, is I understand it correct? In the public column barrier, if we have people making claims to the ashes, there are procedures, the government procedures. So responding to your first question, in the future when the law takes effect, referring to C3610, the agreements and necessary conditions. If you look at Roman numeral two, we require some uh, conditions in two. So that would be very clear in the future. But uh, as shown in past discussion, History is history. What's done cannot be undone. The, the, the contracts, those uh, old contracts, come in so many uh, forms. 
so we can just do the whatever we can to the best of our ability. If you look at C three six three six, three B, uh, sorry. Uh, The reference is to the uh, authorized uh, representative. It's C three six three two bracket three. If you know who is the authorized representative, you have to inform him. But uh, for old contracts, uh, they may or may not be such uh, an authorized representative. Then uh, you, then he has to the. Informed uh, whoever representative uh, is mentioned after reasonable inquiry. On the for the question of uh, authorized representative, it, it talk about uh, so is it a must? It's just talk about arrangements for appointing and replacing authorized representative. Well, we meant to mention that in the future that we are going to have some model uh, contracts, model agreements. Even if you say that uh, you must have a authorized representative, they can uh, just not mention anyone. No name is given. They should uh, appoint an authorized representative. The consumer should do this to protect his interests. But uh, if they insist not to, uh, there's nothing you can do. Well, would you be more specific? If uh, appointing an uh, an authorized representative is mandatory. Shouldn't you say say so? Well, there will be uh, a suitable to bring spaces in the model agreement, but we are not going to force them. Well, so so it's not mandatory. The appointment of an of a representative authorized representative is not mandatory. I just want to ascertain your policy intent. If uh, the intent is, if the policy is to. Make it a mandatory. Then uh, you cannot just talk about. Uh, there must be arrangements for appointing authorized representatives. But what if uh, it's mandatory and uh, no one is appointed? Well, yes, there are people who who have no uh, relatives or no one to rely on. Well, in the model agreement. Uh, this space will be provided. The purchaser will be reminded that uh, there is uh, the possibility of doing this. But the policy intent is not to make it mandatory to fill in this particular blank. Well, we are on the handling of uh, ashes, uh, uh, quite separate from management. So. Uh, If there's no claim, there's no problem. That we have to handle cases where there are competing claims. Uh, Mr. Chen Hanpan's questions has uh, prompted uh, Mr. Albert Chen and Mr. Leung Kok Hong uh, to ask questions on uh, the appointment of. Uh, Authorized representatives, but let's not digress. Uh, let's return to other parts of this schedule. Seven and eight. Uh, we are talking about here the the handling of items. In seven, sub subsection eight applies if a the ash handler is in possession of an item as one related. To the ashes of a deceased person, and before the ashes 
together with the item are returned to a prescribed claimant under this section of person claims to be the owner of the item. The item together with the ashes, if the person also claims for a return of ashes, is called specified item. So this is uh, how we define specified item. Someone can come forward and say that I own the item or I own the item as well as the ashes. Then uh, we will follow subsection 8. In the circumstances specified in subsection 7a, subsections 3, 4, 5, and 6 do not apply to the specified item. And then b, the court may determine competing claims for the specified item in accordance with any law applicable to it, apart from subsections 3, 4, 5, and 6. So the court would apply applicable law. C. The ash handler under Roman 1 must keep the specified item until a person obtains a court order for return of the item to the person and must return the item as ordered. Or 2. If uh, no call order is made by the expiry of 12 months after the overall claim period, the ash handler must deliver the specified item to the director. So the overall claim period is at least 12 months. If there's a dispute, if the court is involved, then uh, by the expiry of 12 months after the overall claim period, uh, there's no call order. The item, the specified item, will be delivered to the uh, director. So it will be at least uh, 12 to 40 months. Legal advisor, bracket 6 and bracket 8 uh, refers to court order. Is there going to be anything on uh, how to apply for a court order in subsidiary legislation? Well, we have uh, communicated with the uh, judiciary. Such a, such cases will be handled by the magistracies. They accept this uh, procedure. As for code of practice, since uh, we're talking about magistracies, they are, they are considering uh, preparing the, some the codes of practice, but uh, we we are not going to introduce subsidiary legislation. We have received reply from the judiciary. Nine six a. If there are competing claims, uh, the uh, ashes must be kept until there's a court order. And also for C, uh, the ash handler has to keep the uh, specified item, but the wording is somewhat different. Not the same, it's the same, sorry. Uh, it's different for, uh, in another place, uh, but that's okay, but that's different. Ten. Half share of expenses of ash disposal procedures to be reimbursed. So, the, so the ash handler has to incur uh, ex expenses since uh, he's required to do so many things. So, uh, this is what section ten is about. Half share of expenses are to be uh, reimbursed. Bracket one. The uh, reasonable expenses incurred by a person, i.e., ash handler, for carrying out the prescribed uh, ash disposal procedure or the on site portion of the procedure as the case requires, are to be apportioned equally be among the sets of uh, ashes in the corriberium as at the date of the commencement of the ash disposal notice. So it's at the commencement as the legal visa. Has uh, 
mentioned. So on a particular day, there are a number of uh, sets of uh, ashes at in the colibarium, and you are you started to the trigger the procedure to return them the ashes. So the uh, expenses will be apportioned equally among the, the, the sets of ashes, and be subject to any rights or obligations that may subsist between the parties under an agreement for the sale of an interment right. A person to whom a set of ashes are returned by the ash handler under this part must on that return day to the ash pay on that return uh, pay to the ash handler half of the ex expenses attributable to that set of ashes so the expenses are apportioned and then uh, when you get the ashes you have to pay half of that uh, apportioned uh, expenses. Why is it that you would uh, require the uh, person to pay half of the expenses? Well, if if there are rights uh, and uh, provisions are provided under the agreement, then uh, it's subject to the agreement, but it may be silent about this. Uh, the whole procedure in c would uh, result in uh, expenses so we want half to be paid by the claimants and the other half by the uh, ash handler questions any questions if not um, section 11 record well since uh, many a lot of things have to be done it's a lot of work as so we need to keep uh, records uh, to the records will be uh, delivered to the director for safekeeping so that uh, subsequently the people can check the records bracket one a person who carries out the prescribed ash disposal procedures or the on site portion of the procedure in respect of a corribarium ash handler must keep a record of the procedures carried out which a must be in the specified form. The form will be specified in the future, and uh, and they will know what information is required. And B must contain the information that the licensing board requires about ashes and claims handled in carrying out the procedures. So the licensing board would tell them uh, in how what information is required to be kept in handling the procedure and the claims. And the records uh, should be compiled in a certain way. Bracket two, subject to subsections three and four, the ash handler, not being the director, must deliver the record to the director within thirty days after the expiry of the overall claim period. In a moment, we're talking about. Uh, Cases involving the director or call order, so, so subject to subsections three and four, uh, the ash handler who is not the director uh, must deliver the record um, to the director of uh, FEH within thirty days after the expiry of the overall claim period. Bracket three. If sections nine bracket six of this schedule applies to the ashes of a deceased person, the period within which the ash handler must deliver that part of the record relating to the ashes of the deceased person to the director is thirty days after the earlier of the following. And if there is a court dispute, they have to wait for the court ruling. So under these conditions, it says the early of the following, and it means A, the return of the ashes of the deceased under that section, and B, the expiry of 12 months after the overall claim period. Here we mean that 9 bracket 6, they are waiting for the court order, and the court order 
could be issued in eight months. So, so in eight months they return the ashes of the deceased. So, and it would be thirty days after that, and it might be eighteen months. And so, thirty days after the eighteen months, that could still be part of a. So some people might want to release the land for other use. Uh, they have uh, already uh, some 24 months have already expired, and then they can return the information to the director 30 days after the expiry of 12 months after the overall claim period. So the earlier of these two, 30 days after the earlier of the f the, the two conditions. And bracket four. In if section nine bracket eight of this schedule, they and just now we explain the owner and items. So section nine eight applies to the ashes of a deceased person and any items interned together with the ashes and the ash handler must deliver the part of the record relating to the ashes of the deceased person and the items to the director 30 days after the earlier of the following and the writing uh, the drafting is similar to the previous clause uh, we have a on the claims for the ashes and items being finally disposed of in accordance with the law referred to in that section and the expiry of 12 months after the overall claim period I had already explained that so we have a similar arrangement. So the earlier of these two conditions, so they need to provide uh, the information to the director of FEHD. Well, 3A and 4A seem to be slightly different. Uh, 3A is referring to returning, and 4A is referring to uh, the disposal. Well, because uh, Section 9.8 is still waiting for the court order. Why is there a different handling? Well, the courts uh, make an order and they have to return the ashes according to the order. And the return of items and ashes uh, according to the court ruling, it is still the same concept. Well, why do we have the final uh, disposal? Because you are uh, implying there is a court ruling. Why is it handled differently? Well, in bracket 5 and 6, uh, we talked about ashes. There is no ash handler uh, appearing. And the claimants uh, have to wait for the court order and uh, they have to return the items but the, there is uh, an ash handler and they have to comply with the law and after the handling they have to return it the items so the drafting is similar to 8 in 8C, they also refer to court order. So the law draftsman could explain this, uh, the drafting. In 11 bracket 4, 11 bracket 4, the wording there, and section 9.8B, they correspond to each other because aside from the ashes there are other items in 9.8 uh, it is required that uh, we must follow the appropriate law and uh, reward the ashes to the appropriate person so in 11.4 when we mention this situation we use a similar drafting to uh, clarify the situation well, why is 3A not drafted uh, like 4A? Because both of them refer to a court ruling. Well, we have to look at uh, 9 
bracket 6 because that refers to ashes and items and regarding the priority we have already listed the priority but since different people have a different priority the court will have to determine in 9 bracket 6 we did not require different uh, applicable laws to determine uh, uh, who, who should be favored in the ruling so in 11.3 we don't uh, have to talk about so many applicable laws uh, the wording is uh, simpler just to correspond to the previous uh, condition okay if that's the case we'll move on to section 12 now in the process we need to authorize the director uh, to facilitate the return of ashes so here it says that the director or an authorized officer may by notice in writing require a person required under section 58 62 64 2 or 3 of this ordinance to carry out the prescribed ash disposal procedures or the on-site portion of the procedures to take any steps that the director or authorized officer considers necessary to facilitate the return of ashes to the eligible claimants or the reinternment of ashes. Any questions? Uh, in section 12, if, uh, if the people don't comply with the director or authorized officer, what are the legal consequences? There are no penalties here. There are no penalties. No penalties. The director has powers to and if they're not complied with uh, law draftsman section 12 it doesn't say that if they do not comply with the director It is not a criminal offense. I think uh, when the director, if uh, nobody claims the ashes, then he, the director would consider whether uh, people had complied with his directions and he might consider that at some point. Any follow-up? No? 13. Director completing prescribed ash disposal procedure. Now just now, we talked about... We're now, we talked about 12. We're now talking about 13. We had said that a lot of people can take the role of ash handler and they need to complete all the procedures and but they might not complete some procedures so here we are dealing with what happens when the procedures are not completed so the title says director completing prescribed ash disposal procedure bracket one Subsections 2 and 3 apply if the director has taken possession of ashes in respect of which the prescribed ash disposal procedures have not been completely carried out. So, regardless of whether A, after a contravention of section 58, 59, 60, 62, or 64, 2, or 3 of this ordinance, so whether they con uh, contravene or don't contravene, whether they breach or not breach, 
and B after a person has done the following as the person is required to do under section 643 of this ordinance that is has Roman numeral one has carried out the on-site portion of the prescribed ash disposal procedures uh, you remember the uh, mortgage and so on they might have only complete a part of it and Roman numeral two has delivered to the director ashes in the columbarium that are not returned to an eligible claimant on the expiry of the on-site claim period and two and three for example they might have only carried out on-site uh, procedures and they they might have a 70 percent uh, and 30 percent is outstanding and the ashes are handed back to the director so here we say in bracket 2 the director must carry out the steps in the prescribed ash disposal procedures to the extent to which they have not been carried out so they have to uh, uh, notify the next of kin to collect the ashes and bracket 3 section 6 8 9 and 11 of the schedule apply with any necessary modifications to the director as a person carrying out the prescribed ash disposal procedures in respect of the ashes that the director must carry out and from 6 to 11 it says that uh, the ash handler has to uh, take out the carry out the following steps uh, they have not done anything so the director might require them to start from step one uh, uh, and there, that uh, the director uh, could fill in and conduct the work. And this is that after modifications, the, the director can take these steps. So that means somebody will have to do the job. No questions. And 14 director's power to dispose of abandoned ashes. Lastly, the director's power to dispose of abandoned ashes. Bracket 1. Any ashes in the director's possession in respect of which the prescribed ash disposal procedures have been carried out the, and it may be disposed of by the director in any manner that the director thinks fit. Bracket 2 says subsection 1 does not apply to any action to any ashes in respect of which proceedings are pending in the court and a person has by written notice informed the director of the proceedings so they are waiting for the court order and uh, the director uh, will not handle the ashes they, uh, until there is a court ruling and on the last occasion, Mr. James Toe said that we might need uh, the deadline. Uh, there is a cost incurred when, uh, so we consider a deadline. Uh, so the handling of the corpses, uh, there is a, t a deadline and uh, we'll deal with that later in bracket four, uh, 14 bracket 1 the director may dispose of it in a, any manner that the director thinks fit including um, he could uh, scatter the ashes in memorial gardens yes chairman 14 bracket 2 if the director is aware of a court ruling then they will not apply subsection one well if somebody oh, if nobody notifies uh, the director but the director is still aware well, even if the director knows but there's no one uh, telling him what would what would the director do well, he must be notified.
and then before subsection one applies. But for some reason, the director knows about it. You still invoke fourteen one fourteen bracket one uh, in disposing of the uh, abandoned ashes. Well, the relevant parties should uh, fulfill their responsibility in uh, notifying the director. Uh, no one should uh, just presume the director knows. Otherwise, uh, the director would uh, just do what is required, and uh, you cannot hold the director accountable. But if, if uh, as a matter of fact, the director knows, he can still uh, invoke the this particular section and uh, do whatever is required. I think for good administration, the director may decide to wait. So we hope uh, the uh, families uh, would uh, inform the uh, direc director. Well, but uh, what you are saying uh, is not uh, reflected in the bill. Mr. Yip Kwok Kim, Chairman, uh, has to uh, leave uh, for other business for the moment. So I'll be chairing the meeting for him. Any any questions on this? Well, I have to attend the transfer panel meeting as well. So it's just you and me. Uh, would you be willing to suspend the meeting? Are you going to return? Well, there's something important uh, next door. So we should pause here. Uh, maybe we should pause here. Are you going to return? Uh, we have to end at 10.30. Why, why don't we ask, uh, allow them to, uh, to leave early? All right, Mr. Ch Chan, you don't have any further question about uh, this particular section? Well, okay, perhaps we should pause here. To, uh, there are a number of concurrent meetings with respect members' choice. Also, meetings adjourned. Thank you.